Welcome to this week's Money Metals Podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these treacherous times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the company voted 2015's Precious Metals Dealer of the Year in the U.S., Money Metals Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap Podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear from Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocker Report. Steve shares his top-notch research with our listeners on some alarming trend changes in silver supply and explains how and why the debt bubble is eventually going to burst and why he believes gold and silver will be the assets to own when it all unravels. Don't miss an incredibly enlightening and eye-opening interview with Steve St. Angelo coming up after this week's market update. Precious metals markets turned down early in the week on renewed fears of a Federal Reserve rate hike. Or at least that's the story the financial media told. It's just as plausible that gold and silver prices pulled back on technical momentum selling in the futures markets. Or that strength in the stock market caused investors to rotate out of safe haven assets, including precious metals. If it were solely fears of a Fed rate hike driving markets, then we wouldn't have seen stocks rally and crude oil climb to a new high for the year at $50 per barrel. Market moves make no sense if you buy into the mainstream narrative that raising interest rates are bad for asset prices. History shows that interest rates tend to rise along with inflation rates. When the Fed overshoots inflation, then yes, it can cause markets to tumble. But with the Fed funds rate barely a quarter of a point above zero, we're a long way from an overshoot. In any event, gold prices are on the decline for a third straight week. As of this Friday morning recording, gold is trending lower again today and trades at $1,214 per ounce, down 3.2% for the week. Silver showed some relative strength midweek to rally off its low point and currently comes in at $16.27 an ounce, a weekly decline of 1.9%. The gold and silver markets have experienced a significant pullback during the month of May. From a big-picture perspective, the drop in price may prove to be a healthy technical event after the precious metals posted their biggest first-quarter advance in decades. But precious metals bulls would certainly like to see these markets find a bottom before the pullback eats deeply into the major uptrend. On a fundamental basis, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium remain solid value propositions compared to high-priced U.S. stocks and low-yielding bonds. Owning metals is like taking out an insurance policy against a meltdown in the currency, the financial system, and the economy. And right now, that insurance is cheap relative to the protection it provides. It's not difficult to imagine what a worst-case scenario would look like. It's playing out in reality right now in Venezuela. The socialist country's long-troubled economy has now nearly collapsed. Venezuelans can't obtain basic necessities such as medicine and food as shortages spread. Many are now so desperate just to survive that they are eating stray animals. People who had savings denominated in the national currency have been wiped out. Inflation in Venezuela is now running at over 720%. During times of hyperinflation, people don't want to take the risk of holding on to cash for even a day. And in Venezuela, barter exchanges are replacing cash transaction as wealth gets measured in terms of things like coffee, tobacco, and soap. In a poor country such as Venezuela, few people can afford to own silver, let alone gold. But for the small government-connected upper class, jewelry and gold and silver bullion are an effective means of preserving wealth. Could the U.S. ever go to hell the way Venezuela has? We could certainly see a similar direction, and in some ways we are. The Venezuelan government promised its people more than it could deliver and ended up destroying the economy through corrupt and incompetent central planning. The U.S. government is also making promises it cannot keep to the tune of tens of trillions of dollars. So far, we have avoided a day of reckoning, but the longer we avoid it through greater borrowing and currency creation, the bigger the problem gets. Physical precious metals are a hedge against whatever turmoil may come. When preparing for the possibility of using gold and silver in barter and trade, you want to make sure you are versatile. You'll want one-ounce coins, of course, 
But for small scale transactions, you'll also want to add fractional sizes, including half ounce and even tenth ounce gold and silver coins or rounds. A bag or two of pre-1965 90% silver dimes, quarters, and half dollars is also essential to any barter stash. These historic coins also have the potential to appreciate in value based on scarcity during times of heightened demand. Beyond acquiring a well-diversified precious metal stash, you should also obtain some basic survival goods, items that may be hard to obtain during an economic panic. Things like extra supplies of long-lasting foods, medicine, bottled water, ammunition, and backup power generators can help you survive emergencies and become more resilient to tough economic times. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocker Report. Steve is an independent researcher and investor who follows the precious metals and energy markets like few others and has one of the very best content-based websites in our entire industry. Steve, welcome back. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah, Mike. It's, uh, looking forward to the conversation. Well, to start out here, Steve, it's it's been several months since we spoke last, so give me your take on the action in the metals here this year, specifically what's driving the recent pullback from the late April highs in gold and silver. Yeah, well, I think what the, the number one factor that caused a big jump in not only physical but also ETF, mostly gold ETF demand, was the big, the big crash in the markets or the big correction, 2,000 points. And what was interesting about this this time around uh, there was uh, like 364 tons that flowed into the gold ETF just in the first quarter. Well, you've got to go back all the way to 2009, during the first quarter of 2009, when the Dow was crashing to like 6,600. It was 400, I believe, 50 tons went into gold ETFs that quarter because investors were scared to death. Well, it only fell 2,000 points, Mike, and investors locked into the gold ETF like it was, it, it, the world was falling apart on a regular, let's say, 10 or 15 percent correction. So this time around, investors were very worried that this was going to be the big one. Well, it didn't happen. And so by the time April came around, the markets recovered and sentiment has changed. And another thing that is on the back of gold and silver prices is the huge commercial short positions. They have increased to record highs uh, as of a couple, let's say, a week or two ago. And so investors are looking at that. And what we needed to do was break through 1300 gold and $18 silver. And that may have pushed uh, a lot more stress on the commercials. But uh, unfortunately, we, did, we almost got there. But it seems as if that was, the, that's that, that was the line the commercial banks used. And we had some huge two, three billion dollar gold uh, knockdowns in a few minutes uh, on several days, and that did it. And so this is where we're at now. And so sentiment is much lower because we didn't get past that thirteen hundred dollar gold and eighteen dollar silver mark. So now we're waiting to see how these commercial shorts play out and what happens going forward. So that's how I see the market right now. Definitely want to talk to you a lot about uh, the supply side of things. You cover that so so closely and have so much great content on that. So you recently broke down uh, the massive increase in demand for the Silver Eagles and Silver Maple Leafs and, and pointed out that the combined annual silver mine production between the U.S. and Canada is short of all the ounces needed each year to mint these two coins, which is a big shift from, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, talk about this here, Steve. What, what did you learn in your research, and what conclusion did you draw there? Because this is a very interesting development in the supply-demand dynamic here in North America. Yeah, and I do think it's important for your readers and listeners to understand we need to focus more on the mid- to long-term fundamentals because fundamentals always win out in the end, even with market manipulation and we'll get into that towards the latter part of the interview. But again, in 2001, uh, U.S. and Canada was producing, like, let's say, a little more than 95 million ounces of silver. And maples and silver eagle sales were like 9 million. So it was less than 10% uh, of overall production. Well, again, like you said, 2015, mine supply was 47 million. It fell in half. But... Just the demand from Silver Eagles and Maples, it was 81 million last year. 
So it, it was like 33, 34 million ounces more than the Canadian and U.S. mine supply. So back in 2001, they had extra silver they could use for industrial purposes, jewelry, silverware. But now they have to import 33 million ounces of silver just to cover the U.S. Eagle and Maple Leaf program. That's phenomenal. And so it's this ongoing trend that we're looking at. Uh, and, again, the North Americans, for some reason, they like to collect silver coins, where in Asia, or let's say India, it's more silver bar. So we're seeing a lot more coins, even rounds, being purchased by North Americans. And that's what's driving the investment market. So I think going forward, we're going to see much higher. I would say maybe 90 million ounces uh, of, of combined U.S. Eagle and silver maples this year. And I, I think production will be about the same. So it's going to be maybe another 7, 8 million deficit just for that. That's, that's huge, Mike. Yeah, and one of the things I found really interesting was the report you did recently highlighting how global investment demand for physical silver bullion products has gone from being a mere 8% of what industrial demand was 10 years ago to now half of what global industrial demand is. And we're not seeing a big drop-off in industrial demand necessarily, although it is down a bit. Uh, who knows, Steve? At, at this rate, w we could soon see more silver production needed for investment purposes than is needed for industrial applications. That's truly mind-boggling based on where we've been. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, if we look at 2005, 6, and 7, uh, investment demand, which is physical bar and coin, was 8% each, for each of those years, 8%. Then 2008 came around and things changed. What happened? We had the first collapse of the U.S. banking and housing market. I call it the first because the second one is still on its way. And they're doing everything they can to keep that from happening, but they can't do it forever. Well, in 2008, it jumped to 29% that year. And now GFMS has recently included in their data private rounds and bars. They did, they did not include that before. They, they couldn't get a good figure. And so what they did is they included it this year in their 2016 World Silver Survey for 2015 uh, data. And it really jumped, I think, 40 to 50 million ounces of silver bar and coin demand last year. So they had to actually revise their figures for 2014, 13, and, and, and so on. And so that is what really pushed up investment demand, which is now 50% of industrial demand. Now, here's the thing. The reason why we got off of the silver standard back in the 60s was silver became too valuable to use in currency. It's really that's what happened, because we were using so much in industry. We couldn't, we couldn't do both. We couldn't have silver coinage and industry, as well as jewelry and silverware. There just wasn't enough silver. So what they did is they took it out of the coin, because it, wasn't, it, was, it would actually push up the price of the coin, too. So now we've been using industry, which has been devouring silver, and it's, half of it is gone forever. And so now I do see at some point in time, if we just had a doubling of last year, it would surpass. If we had a doubling of silver investment where institutions really came in like, they were, like investors were worried in the first quarter of this year, once we get a big crash in the markets, just a doubling from the almost 300 million ounces of bar and coin last year to 600, it would surpass. It would surpass industrial demand, and because that's real, silver and gold are real money. So I do see at some point the demand will really surge, and I don't think there will be the, the supply, Mike. And furthering the point here, you've been following the supply deficit in silver for a, a long while, and I want to get your comments on the on the Thomson Reuters statistics on, on global silver supply and demand here, Steve. You recently reported on a revision that makes the deficit in, in supply worldwide much larger than originally published. So the market has been able to run for more than a decade with this persistent shortage, yet prices, while quite a bit higher than, say, 10 or 15 years ago, they've been lower for the last five years. So what gives there? Yeah, in just a few months, let's say six months, they revised a little more than a billion ounce deficit since, let's say, since 2004 to almost a 1.3 billion ounce deficit. So it's a little less than 300 million ounces they added to the deficit. Now, I've had uh, an email exchange with the head GFMS silver analyst, and uh, I asked, I said, 
I've heard that there were deficits early in the 1980s and 1990s, and uh, I was they sent me the actual supply, demand, and deficits since 1975. And if, if I look at all of them, there were surpluses in the 80s, and there were surpluses especially in the 90s when investors dumped a lot of bar on the market in the middle of the decade because they, they thought prices would, would, would recover, but they never did. So there were surpluses in the 80s, surpluses in the 90s, and it turned out to be about 1.6 billion ounces. That's for both of those decades. Well, guess what? From 2000 to 2015, it's been a 1.6 billion ounce deficit. So in all actuality, this last 15 years, we've been living on the surpluses of the market in the last two decades prior. So why hasn't that impact price? Well, because the market is rigged. Uh, the market's totally rigged. I mean, why is the Dow going up when we're getting the worst uh, fundamental data coming out? It, it is a very strange market, but unfortunately, just like Bear Stearns, Bear Stearns was a company that imploded, and, and so did Lehman Brothers in no time. But the fundamentals to, to understand that they were weak and that they weren't worth the, their stock price and they were bankrupt, that was known probably two, three years before, if you really understood the data. And this is the issue we're dealing with now. Silver and gold are undervalued because the market really doesn't understand the data. When the market understands the data and when the real fundamentals kick in, it will be reverse Lehman Brothers, reverse Bear Stearns, and that's when we'll see the price of gold and silver finally take off. Obviously, with the increase in, in investment demand here, we're seeing a lot of metal flow over to the east, maybe leaving weak hands in the west, going to strong hands in the east. And that metal's likely not to come back anytime soon, so maybe there is more products going into investors' hands. But they're not going to necessarily be willing to give that up unless we see significantly higher prices. I mean, I, I have to think that that's going to be a big part of this as well, is that in order to draw that product back onto the market, if somebody's going to sell it at a profit, uh, they're going to need to see significantly higher prices before they do that, because we are seeing a lot of metal go into very strong hands. Do you see it the same way? Oh, yes. And we have to remember, look what happened in, in 2011 when the average annual price of silver was over $35. Even though we had high uh, silver scrap supply come into the market, it was about 240 million ounces. That was it. That, that's all that came on the market was 240 million ounces. And it was all absorbed. So even if the price doubled to 100, if we saw that price, I, I don't. I actually think we could see less scrap, because here's the issue. When people have a gold coin, and when Americans bought a lot of gold jewelry in the early uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, they bought a lot of gold jewelry because the price of gold was low, and things were going good for them back then. So Americans used it for adornment and bragging purposes, where Indians use it for a nest egg. It's more of a, it's like a, their retirement, their wealth where Americans use it to show that they've got a nice gold ring, well, people will take that gold and they will get it pawned because it's worth the effort to go to the pawn shop and get $500 or $800 for it. But a silver ring doesn't have an ounce of silver in it. And so even if at $100, you're not going to go down to the coin store or the, the jewelry store and pawn it for like 40 bucks. That, this is the reason why jewelry is not really recycled in, in silver, whereas Gold jewelry is because the price is so much higher. So I don't see a huge increase of supply coming into the market and if prices really move higher. And even if it does, Mike, I think it's going to be absorbed. It'll be absorbed very rapidly because gold and silver will be the go-to assets to own in the future. Yeah, certainly, and if recycling is, is not going to necessarily uh, increase substantially with higher prices, uh, then where's that supply going to come from? We know that mine production, of course, it takes a long time for, for mines to sort of get things ramped back up. A lot of them are, are shuttering mines right now, going on care and maintenance, and, and uh, it doesn't just happen immediately to bring those uh, back online as, as prices rise. Uh, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the Dow-Silver ratio. You've been doing some studies on that. Uh, what have you uh, learned through... Uh, through that research, Steve, the, the Dow-Silver ratio? Well, I think this is important because we don't realize how out of whack everything is, Mike. And back in 1980, when silver hit $49, and it also hit 49 
dollars in May of 2011. Thirty something years. The difference was the Dow Jones was 864 points in the first quarter of 1980, and it was like I think it was like the 12 or 13 thousand range in 2011. So the Dow Jones silver ratio 1980 was 25 to one. And then over the next several decades, it really went high. It was 2,500 in June 2001. So you could buy 100 times more silver in 2001 compared to the Dow Jones than you could in 1980. Well, when the prices really increased in 2011, it fell to 250 to 1. The Dow Jones, the silver ratio, fell to 250 to 1. It fell 10 times. And now it's about 1,000 to 1. The thing I want your listeners and readers to understand is this. As the Dow Jones increased 21 times its value since 1980, U.S. debt has increased 22 times. And the total U.S. retirement market has increased 25 times. So when you figure all those together, all those assets, the the Dow Jones and the U.S. retirement market, they all increase almost the same amount as the debt has increased. So all those assets out there are debt assets. They're not, they're not real assets. An asset is something you can sell. Retirement accounts and the, the Dow Jones are claims on future economic activity. And as I've told you about my energy in, analysis, we are peaking in U.S. oil production, and it's going to just get worse from here. So the, the market has funneled assets from physical assets back in the 1970s and 80s, into paper assets, which are the Dow Jones, which are U.S. Treasuries, which are the retirement market, and it's all backed on the debt. So it, there's no coincidence that all these paper assets have ballooned 20-plus times on the back of U.S. debt increasing 22 times. And this is the issue, and investors don't realize it, Mike, that they're invested in claims. They're not invested in assets. And Silver, the average price was thirty dollars in the first quarter of nineteen eighty. It's sixteen dollars today. So, if investors had been putting their money instead of in retirement account, which is an, a Ponzi scheme, and they had put it in gold and silver, the values of gold and silver would have been much higher today, and the, the uh, retirement market or the Dow Jones would have been much less. So, that's the problem. This is what's happened over the past three decades. Speaking of energy, you alluded to it there a moment ago. Anyone who visits your site, Steve, will see the acronym EROI, which stands for Energy Returned on Invested. Uh, Now, I want to explore this with you for a minute here and and have you explain that to our listeners. But before uh, we go any further, I want to read an excerpt from an article you put out this week related to this subject, and then I'll get your comments. You wrote, Folks, it won't matter how much money is floating around in the future as energy production plummets. Who cares if there are trillions of M2 or M3 outstanding? You're talking about the money supply there. When we won't have enough energy to continue running a system that only can function by a growing energy supply. To base the future value of gold on outstanding currency is folly. Which is precisely why I label gold and silver as investments. Their value will surge as most paper and physical asset values collapse. The revaluation of gold and silver will occur well beyond the collapse of fiat money. They will also rise in value due to the disintegration of most physical and paper assets. This is well beyond the scope of money or insurance. So please give us a brief explanation of EROI in layman's terms and then expand on the excerpt I just read and tell us why you believe this is all going to point to much higher gold and silver prices. Yeah, Mike, and my analysis is different than most of the precious metals analysis because they look at the Austrian school of economics and they look at the money supply. And so uh, like Jim Sinclair and even Jim Rickards, they forecast ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollar gold based upon how much money supply is out there. And as, I, as you stated in that quote, it won't matter how much M1 or M2 or M3 is out there if energy production declines. And so we have to remember the huge debt that we have now is twenty trillion. That's just that's just public and private. That is that's I call that energy debt. And so the, the problem we have now, and it's all based on the energy return on invested, and simply the energy return on invested means uh, how much energy you put in to get energy out. 
And when, the, when this country first started getting into uh, producing oil, it was high. It was 100 to 1. So when we, when we uh, put one barrel of energy out, we burned one barrel of energy, we got 100 barrels in the market. Well, it has fallen drastically. 1920s, one barrel found 1,500 barrels. Now it's 5 to 1. In matter of fact, ConocoPhillips, because the price is so low, ConocoPhillips is, is actually excluded exploration. They've stopped all exploration. And ConocoPhillips is the third largest oil company in the United States. So they were finding now 5 to 1, but I think that's even going to fall. So the energy return on invested is really declining. Oil, the shale oil industry is 5 to 1. Where it used to be a hundred to one in 1970, it was thirty to one. So, our economy, our modern society needs something twelve to one energy return on invested. And shale oil isn't paying the bills. In deep water is almost it's like ten to one. So we are in big trouble. And let me tell you how much trouble we're in. The U.S. energy sector is facing three hundred and seventy billion in debt. And you know, last year. They paid almost $17 billion of their operating profits just to pay the service, the interest on their debt. Not to, not to pay the debt down, just to pay the interest on the debt. Well, it, it, it was even worse in the first quarter of this year. It was 86% of their profits went just to pay the interest on the debt. Now, yes, the oil price has gone up a little bit. But the reason why the oil price has gone up a little bit is because China is, is absorbing a lot. They have increased their strategic reserve. The, the world isn't uh, consuming all, all this oil. Some of it is being stockpiled at these cheap prices. So I don't think we're going to see higher prices. We could see lower prices here uh, when China finally fills up their, their reserve. So the, the thing is, Going forward, U.S. production, oil production, is already down almost a million barrels since its high last year. A million is gone. It's not coming back. It's not coming back. And we can't afford high oil prices either. That was a three-, four-year phenomenon because of zero interest rates and money printing. It might go on a little bit longer, but the debt now is too high, Mike. This is the problem. The debt in the energy industry, as I just explained to you, and the debt in the system is too high. It's six dollars of debt to get one dollar of GDP. It's a disaster. Now, how long can this go on? It can, it can probably go on a little bit longer, but the fundamentals will kick in. And when those fundamentals kick in, by gosh, if you're in paper assets and if you're in real estate, you're going to be in trouble because paper assets are going to implode and real estate prices are going to implode because they're going to be sunk assets because you can't run a huge suburban economy on 20, 30, 50% less of the energy you used to running it. And so that's going to impact real estate prices. And I've been just saying this on interviews with you over the past year or two, but it just gets worse going forward. And investors don't see this. Most investors don't see it. But it, it's, going to, it's going to make its way. And when it does make its way, again, I, that's why I think the, the best liquid assets to own are physical gold and silver. And they are investments. There will be much more than just money. And that's how I see it. Yeah, it's a very fascinating outlook and take on everything, and that's one reason why we, we like to have you on so much. You bring a, a very uh, unique perspective there, one that a lot of people are not considering, and, and always enjoy talking to you about that. Well, before we let you go, Steve, if you can let our listeners know how they can learn a little bit more about the SRS Rocker Report, so what they'll find there, and then uh, any uh, parting words before we close. Yeah, we uh, at the SRS Rock Report we put out about two or three articles, mostly on precious metals mining, uh, and then I include energy. Even though, unfortunately, when I do an energy article, the reads are uh, <laughs> maybe ten percent, fifteen percent of the precious metals, but actually it, it should be the, the other way around. The energy is the driver. You know, if a person is sick, let's like, say they call, oh, I'm definitely sick. I can't get out of bed. You don't have the energy. You got a flu, and it, it takes you out. You know, you can't get out of bed you can't go to work. You have to have the energy to get out of bed. You have to have the energy in your car, the gasoline to get you to work. And you have to have the energy to produce, that actually runs the whole system. And unfortunately, solar and wind and renewables, they don't work. They'll, they'll never work. On an individual basis, it's probably wise to have solar on your home if the grid goes down. But on large scale, they don't work. They just they won't ever work, unfortunately. I've done, done the math on them. 
So in the future, your uh, readers and listeners should continue looking at the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are showing us more people are getting into the metals, even though the price doesn't show it. And the energy situation, it continues to get worse. And so with the debt now on the system, it's going to be hard for the establishment to continue business as usual. I don't know how long this will continue, but each, each six months, each year, it just gets worse. And the best thing to do is to purchase precious metals physically on an ongoing basis, just like your retirement account. Instead of having claims or IOUs in an account, it's better to have stored economic energy in a gold or silver coin or bar in a place of safekeeping. And that's how I, would, I see the thing going forward, Mike. We both agree that uh, we don't know exactly when the system is going to collapse, but it certainly looks like we're we're headed that direction, and uh, it's probably just a matter of time. It's all uh, very enlightening stuff. More people need to wake up and recognize what's going on here, and I think uh, you're a big part of that, Steve. Thanks for all the work that you do there. We appreciate your time, as always, and hope you have a great weekend. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. All right, Mike. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocker Report. SRSRockerReport.com is the website, one of the best metals markets-related sites in the entire industry. He talks a lot about the energy and ties it all together. Be sure to check that out. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly Market Wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.